Hear my prayer. Clerics are broken. Hello and welcome to Constructed Chaos. Today we're going to have a look at how to support, heal, smite, and ask God for favors as a broken cleric in D&D 5e. A lot of people see the cleric and imagine a character forced onto the sidelines as they heal others, support their allies, and pray sweet nothings to their divine patron while everyone else gets to do cool stuff. Firstly, I'd like to go on record as saying there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I love playing as a support character within the party composition. But if you think that's all the cleric is about, you're undead wrong. Don't think too hard about if that joke made sense or not. I'm not really sure either. In reality, clerics can be incredible damage dealers, casters, frontliners, or otherwise, to the point where your DM will want to pull their hair out. Trust me, I've been that DM and now I have no hair left. And on top of this, your cleric's devout divinity might look a bit different from the typical holy boy that wishes to adhere only to the designated boring corner of the alignment chart. Your domain of service can range wildly from the perfect pacifist to a worshiper of warfare or even a hailer of all things heretical. But whoever you serve, just don't forget their name. They tend to be kind of conceited. That said, regardless of what you have in mind for your character and build, you'll probably want to lead off with Wisdom as your highest stat, since Cleric is a Wisdom-based spellcaster primarily. In most cases, you'll probably want to follow that up with a decent Constitution score for some extra health and to help with your concentration spells, and a decent Strength or Dexterity depending on your build. Finally, Intelligence or Charisma might be important to you depending on your subclass choice. Really, there can be a lot of variance here. You may end up doing something completely different from this, but for most clerics, you should at least consider keeping Wisdom and Constitution as your highest priority ability scores. Keeping that fresh in mind, it should be a no-brainer that your race or species choice should be something that gives you a nice boost to those stats. Options like the Furbolg, Water Genasi, Gitzerai, and specifically the Hill Dwarf are just a few that work really well as clerics. Of course, if you're open to it, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything does allow you to assign your bonuses however you'd like, regardless of your race, so you can always go that direction if you want to. And when you choose Cleric as your starting class, you'll get a d8 hit die and 8 plus your constitution modifier and starting hit points, proficiency in light and medium armor, shields, simple weapons, and any two skills from history insight, medicine, persuasion, and religion, as well as wisdom and charisma saving throws. Right away, your cleric spellcasting will come online and you'll have access to a slew of incredible first level spells and a few cantrips. You'll have to choose those cantrips right away, but your spells will actually be prepared each time you finish a long rest. So you'll be able to make ready a number of spells equal to your cleric's level plus your wisdom modifier every day. And by thinking ahead about what your plans are for the day, you should often have exactly what you need. And as for spell slots, here's a chart to show you what you'll have with respect to your cleric level. That said, I'd recommend considering the Sacred Flame, Guidance, Spare the Dying, and Thaumaturgy cantrips for your three picks starting out. Guidance in particular is a bread and butter support spell for you and your party, so long as you use it before someone rolls for a check so it isn't too late to tack on that d4. Also, just a few of the first level spells that you might end up preparing more often than not are Inflict Wounds, Bless, Healing Word, and Guiding Bolt. Inflict Wounds in particular is one that I find a lot of players sleep on with a whopping 3d10 damage being possible this early on. Finally, don't forget that your cleric's spellcasting ability will be Wisdom, meaning that your spell modifier and spell attack bonus will be your proficiency bonus, plus your Wisdom modifier and your spell save DC will be that, plus eight. Though you may now be realizing that many of your spells don't actually rely directly upon that wisdom score. For example, Bless, one of my personal favorites, just straight up works on three creatures by giving them an extra d4 to add to attack rolls and saving throws, regardless of your wisdom score. And it's this simple observation along with the fact that we'll be getting our subclass at level one that makes Cleric an excellent multi-class dip. I've done this with more than a few characters to startlingly potent effect, but if you're not quite familiar with 5e's multiclassing rules, I'll leave a handy link to my guide for that here. Now, there are quite a few of these subclasses to choose from. 
each offering you new features at 1st, 2nd, 6th, 8th, and 17th level. Not even I will be able to cover every single feature that they offer, and really there aren't any bad choices that can't simply be carried along by the extremely robust Cleric class chassis of features and spells. Now to simplify things, each of them will offer some similar features, such as a unique Channel Divinity feature that expands on the second level feature that all clerics get. Many will get varying weapon, armor, and or skill proficiencies, and a set of spells that are not only added to your cleric spell list, but also count as being always prepared for your character. Now, first up, we have the Arcana Domain. A bit of an odd one to begin with, this subclass implies your character's worship of a god of magic itself, resulting in your cleric taking on a bit more of a wizard's bookish flavor. Now, that doesn't limit your choice of deity to just one or two options. You could just as well worship Mistra, the mother of all magic, or a lich like Vecna. After all, you'll soon realize that being a cleric does not necessarily mean that you're a good person. Your list of domain spells will contain notable entries like Magic Missile, Dispel Magic, Arcane Eye, and Teleportation Circle, which are decent enough spells, but not necessarily an expansion on anything the Cleric was lacking before. And right away, you'll also gain proficiency in the Arcana skill and two cantrips from the Wizard's spell list. Moving on to your Channel Divinity, you'll be allowed to turn a Celestial, Elemental, Fey, or Fiend within 30 feet for a minute against a Wisdom saving throw. This grows even more potent at 5th level whenever the effect is equivalent to the banishment spell without requiring concentration, so long as it's below a certain challenge rating. Later, you'll gain abilities that allow you to end the effects of spells on creatures you heal, add your wisdom modifier to the damage you deal with your cantrips, and eventually add a 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th level spell from the wizard's spell list to your always prepared domain spells. This is where the subclass really shines, and it basically turns your super powerful cleric into a super powerful wizard as well. Granted, this does only happen at 17th level. Everything up to this point is a bit lackluster, but if you're playing in some high level sessions, this is definitely a subclass that you'll want to keep in your back pocket. Now, while you still have liches fresh on the mind, we should discuss the death domain cleric. As you might expect, this subclass option takes a distinctly darker turn because who says the cleric and the necromancer can't get along. You'll serve just about any deity dealing with the deaths or undeaths of mortals, whether they be gods of murder or vampires that sustain their lives by feeding on the living. Fittingly, you'll gain some decent domain spells like False Life, Animate Dead, Blight, and Cloud Kill that are mostly, sadly, already on the cleric spell list anyway. These are flavorful and useful at the very least, but again, they aren't adding much to the cleric's abilities beyond what the base class already provides. You will also gain proficiency with martial weapons at first level and a necromancy cantrip from any spell list that can target two creatures instead of just one so long as they're within five feet of each other. And your channel divinity will lend you a smite-like ability that allows your cleric to deal five plus twice your cleric level in necrotic damage to a target creature when you hit that creature with a melee attack. This begins in interesting trend wherein a lot of these abilities seem to imply that you should be within melee range of your enemies. Later, you can ignore necrotic damage resistances, infuse your weapon strikes with an additional 1d8 necrotic damage per turn, later increase that to 2d8 damage per turn, and finally target two creatures instead of just one for spells other than cantrips as well. Again, so long as they're within five feet of each other. If you're feeling less than enthused about this entry, you aren't alone. It seems to want your 1d8 hit die cleric to be out on the front lines without any extra armor proficiencies, and all you get in return is some extra damage and dual targeting cantrips and spells with a caveat. This one isn't my favorite either, but it can serve you well enough by riding off the back of the potent cleric base class. Next, the Forge Domain Cleric will help us shake off the memory of the dead with some absolutely stellar features. To bring these abilities to bear, you'll serve the gods of creation, crafting, and smithing with a focus on liberating locations, tools, and weapons from the wrong hands in an effort to influence the world for the better. To aid you in this task, you'll get great spells like Searing Smite, Heat Metal, Wall of Fire, and Animate Objects to name a few. And you'll get heavy armor proficiency with this one along with Smith's tools. Also at first level, you'll be able to take a page from the Artificer's book and give a non-magical weapon or set of armor a plus one to attack and damage rolls or a plus one to AC respectively 
once per long rest. Right at the start of the game, that's really, really powerful. The channel divinity, on the other hand, is flavorful, but might not be as extremely useful as you're allowed to create a metal object worth no more than 100 gold pieces, but you'll still need the materials worth of that amount of money to craft it anyway. But that's really where the disappointment ends, because from there, you'll gain resistance to fire damage, get a plus one to AC while wearing heavy armor, add an extra 1d8 fire damage to your melee attacks once per turn, eventually increase that to 2d8, and ultimately gain immunity from fire damage, and gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks while wearing heavy armor. True, that last ability might leave just a little bit to be desired, as much of what you'll be up against at 17th level will be magical. But this is a damn good subclass, even so, with some great flavor equipped for tanking, crafting, and smiting, alongside all the other awesome stuff the Cleric can already do on its own. Next, the Grave Domain Cleric takes us back towards some of the deathly themes that we explored just a moment ago, but trust me, this one's way better, and in my opinion, it's more flavorful too. This subclass deals less in the unnatural lengthening of one's life and more focuses on protecting the sanctity of death and the special circumstances of life. If anything, the grave domain should thematically be the opposite of the death domain, yet their domain spells include options like Bane, Revivify, Blight, again, and raise dead. At least you won't have to worry about prepping Revivify every single day. And to that end, you'll also get a feature at first level that allows you to max out dice used for healing creatures at zero hit points, and the spare the dying cantrip with a range of 30 feet, and a bonus action casting time. But the first level features don't stop there. You'll also gain the ability to sense the presence of undead within 60 feet of you a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier per long rest. Your channel divinity will allow you to curse a creature within 30 feet of you until the end of your next turn, giving it vulnerability to any damage it takes the next time it takes damage from you or an ally of yours. This can be particularly useful if you've got a rogue or paladin in the party that can deal a lot of damage already with a single attack. Moving along, you'll be able to use your reaction to turn a crit against a creature within 30 feet into a normal hit, add your wisdom modifier to the damage you deal with the cantrip, and even heal yourself or your allies when an enemy dies within 60 feet of you by the number of hit die they have. Needless to say, this is a major improvement over the death domain, and it wouldn't be all that hard to just use the mechanics of this subclass with the flavor of the other. You'll still be using many of the same spells anyway after all. As one of the first options for the cleric introduced in the player's handbook, the knowledge domain has aged a bit, but still carries some interesting flavor in the form of a more intelligence-based cleric that worships their deities as keepers of lore, inventors, and even explorers. Their domain spells include entries like Identify, Augury, Speak with Dead, and Legend Lore that'll see you always ready to easily uncover your DM secrets. But these can be somewhat situational, and there's not that much on this list that you'd be happy to have in a fight, or even in most sessions. Somewhat making up for this, you'll learn two languages of your choice and become proficient in two skills out of arcana, history, nature, or religion, and have double proficiency in those skills. At second level, your channel divinity will allow you to grab proficiency in one skill or tool for 10 minutes as an action to help you fill in any gaps in your party's abilities, and you'll gain another channel divinity at sixth level that allows you to read a creature's thoughts and possibly cast the suggestion spell on them without expending a spell slot. From there, you can add your wisdom modifier to the damage you deal with your cantrips and eventually unlock detailed visions related to objects you have in your possession or your immediate surroundings. These can come in pretty clutch when dealing with mysterious items or dungeon puzzles and traps set by the enemy. That said, I'd hope for a bit more than just a few helpful hints from visions your DM is ultimately in control of at 17th level, and while the features leading up to this aren't bad, you may at some point just have to wonder why you aren't playing something like a scribe's wizard or maybe even a bard or rogue if you like having those high skill checks. Next up, we have the Life Domain, another oldie but definitely a goodie. This subclass embodies the quintessential cleric healer that most dungeon delvers expect out of this class. And since when has doubling down on what you're best at ever been a bad thing? As you might guess, your domain spells will include options like Bless, Lesser Restoration, Revivify, and Mass Cure Wounds, to name a few. Which is nice because you were probably going to be preparing at least a few 
of these each day anyway. And right away at first level, when you heal creatures with a spell of first level or higher, you'll heal by an extra two plus the spell's level. Plus, you'll get the coveted heavy armor proficiency. Also, your channel divinity will allow you to do some extremely fast healing with a number of hit points equal to five times your cleric level divided among any number of creatures within 30 feet of you as you see fit, so long as you aren't healing them above half of their maximum hit points. Having something like this in your back pocket can be extremely clutch, and it just gets better from here as you can eventually heal yourself with spells you use to heal others by two plus the spells level, deal extra radiant damage with your weapon attacks, and always roll maximum healing on spells you use to support your allies. Yes, all of this bolstered healing doubles down on what the cleric is arguably best at, but don't forget that this broken class can do so much more. If you're curious as to what I mean, just watch a few episodes of our first campaign. The cleric in those games, Cheryl, was a force to be reckoned with in more ways than one, and they played with this crazy powerful subclass. On the opposite side of the holy spectrum, we have the light domain. Clerics of this variety are generally all about bringing light to the darkest parts of the world. As, as they, they purge, purge the, dark the darkness in a, in a sacred, sacred fire, fire and, and banish, banish it from whence it came. You'll get some righteous domain spells like fairy fire, fireball, wall of fire, and flame strike. Detect a theme here? And many of these spells aren't already on the cleric spell list. Additionally, at first level, you'll get the light cantrip and can temporarily blind a creature attacking you within 30 feet as a reaction in order to impose disadvantage on the attack. You can only do this wisdom modifier times per long rest, but that's still extremely powerful as a defensive option at level one. The channel divinity gives you 2d10 plus your cleric level in radiant damage while also banishing any magical darkness within 30 feet of you, and you'll eventually be able to impose disadvantage on attacks against creatures other than you, add your wisdom modifier to cantrip damage, and create a bright aura of sunlight in a 60 foot radius that automatically imposes disadvantage on your enemies for saving throws against spells that deal fire and radiant damage. Basically, this subclass boosts your damage dealing capabilities while also giving you a chance to thwart attacks from enemies against your allies. Couple that with a base cleric class and you've got a fiery entry ready to effectively turn the tables in combat. Next, the nature domain adds some druidic flavor to your cleric. Where druids worship nature and hold dear all natural things, your cleric will enact the will of their deity by thwarting evil creatures that wander in the wilds or by blessing or damning the crops of believers and non-believers respectively. Though the concept is a little different here, your domain spells will take a page from the druid spell list, with entries like speak with animals, spike growth, plant growth, and insect plague. These aren't exactly top tier picks of the litter, but you will also get a druid cantrip of your choice, as well as proficiency in one skill out of animal handling, nature, or survival. And ironically enough, this is one of the options that'll give your cleric heavy armor proficiency, so you won't have to worry about that weird issue druids have with metal objects. Your channel divinity will allow you to charm animals and plants within 30 feet of you as an action for a minute against a wisdom saving throw, but that isn't all that useful all that often. At best, I'd describe it as niche. From there, you can give elemental resistance to a creature within 30 feet as a reaction when they take acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage, add 1d8 cold, fire, or lightning damage to your weapon attacks once per turn, which increases to 2d8 later, and eventually gain the ability to command your charmed plants and animals as a bonus action. Sadly, the capstone here is a bit of a letdown as it stacks on the less than ideal channel divinity feature you gain at second level, but there are some decent abilities mixed in there. At the end of the day, this option can be good in the right campaign or adventure, but even then, it just barely lives up to the expectation and leaves a lot to be desired. Sorry. <laughs> Moving on, the order domain puts the law into lawful whatever as your cleric becomes a bastion of rule following. Notably, this doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be restricted to abiding by the laws of the society that you reside within, as you may instead be beholden to logic or your own sense of justice through the eyes of your god. Come to think of it, it might be really cool to do an order domain cleric from the Feywild that enforces all the laws that they have there. Anyway, you'll get some decent flavor in domain spells like heroism, zone of truth, slow, and dominate person, as well as proficiency in heavy armor and either intimidation or persuasion. Also at first level, you can enable your allies to attack with a weapon as a reaction when you target them with a spell of first level or higher, which can be pretty nice at low levels when you're consistently healing your friends with spells like 
like Cure Wounds and Healing Word. Your channel divinity will allow you to charm any number of creatures around you against a wisdom saving throw and even force creatures that fail the save to instantly drop whatever they're holding. Weapons, hostages, or otherwise. Do that. Stop in the name of the law. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, whatever you need. That's fine. It's kind of like the Nature Domain version, except actually good. From there, you'll be able to cast enchantment spells of first level or higher as a bonus action, add 1d8 psychic damage to your weapon attacks once per turn, eventually increase that damage to 2d8, and even mark your enemies that you strike as cursed so that they take an extra 2d8 damage when an ally strikes them next. Now, this capstone is a bit less potent than I'd like, but the subclass is pretty great leading up to that. Turning spells like Bane and Bless into bonus actions and getting a bunch of extra action economy off of your leveled spells can really stack your advantage. Honestly, this even seems like it could be a really cool set of abilities for a captain of the guard or some lawful evil enemy for a party to fight if you're a DM watching this. Now we come to one of my personal favorites in the peace domain, which is not necessarily as pacifistic as you might think from the name. Ironically enough, clerics of this variety are often driven to violence in order to defend the peace that is their namesake and resolve conflicts that might otherwise disturb it. And they're armed with a great supportive list of domain spells, including entries like Sanctuary Aid, Autoluke's Resilient Sphere, and Greater Restoration. There's not much here that the cleric doesn't already have access to, but the spells on the list are still relatively good ones, so you'll likely be fairly glad to have them. From the beginning, you'll also get proficiency in insight, performance, or persuasion in one of my all-time favorite abilities in the cleric's arsenal emboldening bond. This ability allows you to, as an action, bond proficiency bonus number of creatures within 30 feet of you for 10 minutes. This bond works similarly to spells like Bless, except that it adds a d4 to an attack roll ability check or saving throw once per turn, so long as that creature is within 30 feet of another bonded creature. All those d4s can really add up, especially this early when you get this ability at first level and get this, it can stack with Bless. We'll touch more on this a bit, but this feature alone is absolutely cracked. So much so that it makes your channel divinity at second level look worse than it is, even though it allows you to heal your allies by 2d6 plus your wisdom modifier using your movement speed and without provoking opportunity attacks. Realistically, this is going to be a little less potent later on, but is damn strong at second level. Later on, your emboldening bond gets an upgrade that allows bonded creatures to teleport as a reaction to another bonded ally within 30 feet taking damage, resulting in the teleporting creature taking the damage instead. Even as a movement option, this is pretty crazy. There's some extra cheese you can grade out by doing damage to your own ally that has climbed or flown to a place that you can't normally get to. Further along, you'll also be able to add your wisdom modifier to the damage that you deal with your cantrips and increase the range of your bonds from 30 feet to 60 feet instead, while also giving creatures resistance to damage when they teleport to take damage from others. Congrats, you now have an entire support network of friends and allies that will take resisted damage for each other and consistently land their cool attacks and save against enemies and succeed skill checks and what more can you ask for? Do not sleep on this one. It is so much better than you think and it actually makes me excited to play support builds. Hopefully it's doing the same for you. But if it's not, the Tempest Domain should get you some in-your-face action alongside the Cleric's typical healing and support talents. This subclass basically turns you into Thor as you serve, well, Thor. And of course, that means tons of lightning, thunder, and weather-flavored spells like Thunder Wave, Shatter, Call Lightning, and Ice Storm. This subclass happens to have one of my favorite domain spell lists, of all the choices available. And on top of that, you will be getting proficiency in both martial weapons and heavy armor. Also at first level, you'll be able to use a reaction to deal 2d8 lightning or thunder damage against a dexterity saving throw for half damage when you're hit by a creature within five feet of you. While you can only do this wisdom modifier times per long rest, 2d8 is pretty great damage as a reaction at first level. And your channel divinity allows you to max out that damage as well, as it states that you can maximize your 
four rolls anytime you roll for thunder and or lightning damage. From there, you'll be able to push large or smaller creatures 10 feet when you deal lightning damage, deal an extra 1d8 thunder damage once per turn when you land a weapon attack, increase that damage to 2d8 later, and eventually gain a flying speed equal to your walking speed when you're not underground or indoors. Yes, yes, that 17th level ability comes on pretty damn late and isn't that much use to us by that point. But so long as your enemy is taking that thunder and lightning damage without resistance or immunity, you're going to feel like an absolute broken god yourself on the battlefield. Next up, the trickery domain will see you serve a god such as Loki. And while that's the god most people will choose, I prefer an option like Garl Glittergold, the gnomish god that tricked the kobold god and trapped them forever. To aid in your clever bouts of mischief, you'll get domain spells like Pass Without Trace, Mirror Image, Blink, and Polymorph. This list of spells adds a whole new utility and use case for your cleric that wasn't there before and totally plays right into the trickery theme. And you'll also be able to give another creature advantage on stealth checks for an hour if you want a little help in stirring up trouble. Your channel divinity pitches in pretty nicely as well as you're able to create an illusion of yourself that you can cast spells through for a minute. You can even give yourself advantage on attack rolls by using a bonus action to move the illusion within five feet of a creature to distract it. Now this channel divinity will require your concentration, but it gets even better later and it is probably too good already not to use. At 6th level, you'll gain an additional channel divinity that allows you to become invisible until the end of your next turn, becoming visible if you attack or cast a spell, but this is less likely to get used since it's basically just a worse version of the invisibility spell. Continuing along, you'll get to add 1d8 poison damage to your weapon attacks once per turn, later increasing that to 2d8, and eventually create 4 illusory duplicates of yourself instead of just the one when you use your channel divinity. While the poison damage is a bit of a bummer and the really cool four illusion ability doesn't fully come online until 17th level, this can be a pretty great subclass leading up to that. Don't worry, there's a way to get around the poison damage. The domain spells in your first channel divinity definitely make this one worth it, even if it's not quite as potent as other options. Now we arrive at the subclass that I know you've at least heard about, the Twilight Domain. There's no sugarcoating this one, it's absolutely broken. It might even be the best subclass in the game, let alone the best one for clerics. And to attain this power, you'll serve gods that work as protectors of the transition from day to night, ensuring that the terrors of the dark are held at bay. And the broken nature of this subclass shows itself right off the bat with one of the best lists of domain spells of any cleric subclass, including entries like Fairy Fire, Liamman's Tiny Hut, Greater Invisibility, and Circle of Power to name a few. And there's a lot more to like here than just those few. Also at first level, you'll gain proficiency in martial weapons and heavy armor, and you'll also gain dark vision out to 300 feet. And you can magically share that ability with proficiency bonus creatures within 10 feet of you. I mean, if seeing is believing and you're looking for converts, I'm pretty sure you can see God with 300 feet of dark vision. And we're still not done with first level as you can also give advantage on initiative rolls to any one creature you can touch, including yourself. So in combat, you'll probably be getting a pretty good spot in the initiative order and that will play quite nicely into your channel divinity. At second level, you are able to create a sanctuary of twilight in a 30 foot radius centered on you for a minute without any form of concentration. This sanctuary can either grant a creature 1d6 plus your cleric level in temporary hit points or end a charmed or frightened effect instantly when that creature ends its turn within the sphere. That is bonkers. And at second level, you can reasonably assure that all of your allies are bolstered by a pretty sizable buffer before they even take damage and that buffer replenishes every turn without you really having to do much at all. Even at later levels, this will really mitigate the amount of healing you need to do in order to keep your party up and at common tiers of play, it's just broken as hell, but it still doesn't stop there. At sixth level, you'll get a bonus action flying speed for one minute so long as you're in dim light or darkness. Eighth level gives you an extra 1d8 radiant damage on your weapon attacks once per turn that eventually becomes 2d8 at 
14th level. And at 17th level, your Twilight Sanctuary gives you and your allies half cover while within it. Honestly, this subclass is so good that it makes the 17th level ability look lackluster but half cover for you and your friends is actually damn good too. An extra plus two to AC and dexterity saving throws for you and your entire party? When is that ever not going to be good? That's better than each of your allies holding a shield. I can't stress this enough. This subclass is literally broken. It will trivialize deadly encounters just by existing and it'll make your squishy low level party nearly invincible as you get your bearings at the start of a long running campaign. And it even pairs extremely well with multi-classing options like Gloomstalker Ranger and the Assassin Rogue too, since so much of this comes online so early. You will never regret playing a Twilight Cleric unless you actually wanted a challenge. Now let's all take a deep breath as we cover the War Domain, our final Cleric subclass option. Clerics of this variety will not find quite the same level of potency that the last entry offered, but it will go a long way in taking your character from a priest into a hero on the battlefield. In serving one of the various gods of war, your cleric will get domain spells that include divine favor, spiritual weapon, spirit guardians, and hold monster. It also grants you proficiency in martial weapons and heavy armor at level one. Also at level one, you'll get to attack as a bonus action whenever you take the attack action, but the uses of this ability are limited to wisdom modifier times per long range rest, which may be a problem we pick up on later. Your channel divinity allows you to deploy a plus 10 bonus to an attack roll before you know if the attack hits or misses so that you can strike with supernatural accuracy. This ability gets even better at sixth level when you can grant the same bonus to another creature within 30 feet of you as a reaction, which can pair pretty nicely if you've got something like a rogue in the party that deals a ton of damage with just one strike. From there, you'll get to add an extra 1d8 damage to your weapon attacks once per turn, later increase that to 2d8 and eventually gain a permanent resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. Of course, as we've seen before, this final feature leaves a lot to be desired on account of how much damage by 17th level will already be magical. But the real problem here is how this all adds up within the cleric class itself. You're burning your action and bonus action on melee attacks, taking damage from the front lines, and likely not holding on to concentration with something like spirit guardians for as long as you might want to. Ultimately, you're not healing and supporting your allies, and you're probably not dishing out as much damage as you could be traditionally either. But with that said, we can finally move past level one. I told you it was a lot. Though, if you're finding all the info helpful, you should probably drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. The gods command it. Subscribe. Or, I mean, don't do it. What's the worst that could happen? At level two, you'll unlock the cleric's channel divinity feature, something we've touched on with our subclass options. But let's take a moment to go over the base mechanics here. At this level, you'll have a single use of your channel divinity until you complete at least a short rest. But you'll eventually get two uses at sixth level and three uses at 18th level. And along with what you get from your domain selection, the cleric class itself will give you a turn undead channel divinity option that does more or less what you'd expect. Undead that can see or hear you within 30 feet are turned by you for one minute or until it takes damage pending a wisdom saving throw. Turned creatures must use their whole movement to get as far from you as possible. Additionally, it can only use the dash action unless there's nowhere to run and then it must take the dodge action and it can't take reactions at all. And it's worth noting that once they fail the save, they don't get to repeat it ever. It's just active until the effect ends. Needless to say, a fight against the undead is mostly going to be a cakewalk for your cleric because of this, but it is generally going to be limited to that kind of interaction. It'll offer you no real help against a tribe of goblins or a sect of cultists, so you may want to focus on utilizing the channel divinity feature you get from your subclass for the most part. But there is also an optional cleric feature from Tasha's called Harness Divine Power, in which you can use your channel divinity as a bonus action to replenish one of your expended spell slots that's no higher than half your proficiency bonus rounded up. You might not utilize this often, but it's worth knowing that it's there if your DM allows the optional rules. Third level doesn't really introduce any new features, but it does see us gain access to second level spells. And then at fourth level, we'll get our first ability score improvement or feat. You'll get another chance for this at 8th, 
12th, 16th, and 19th level, and these milestones also coincide with another optional rule from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. At any time you'd get an ability score improvement, you can also utilize cantrip versatility to replace one of the cantrips from the cleric spell list with another. Pretty simple, but good to know in case you feel your god pulling you in a different direction. At 5th level, your channel divinity will get an upgrade and some undead will be instantly destroyed by your turn undead feature. This challenge rating threshold will increase as you increase in level, so here's a handy chart that details what creatures you can blow up with your holiness. Again, this is pretty niche, but great to have against undead enemies specifically. Necromancers in your party are probably going to hate this, and they'll hate it even more when you start casting some of the same spells they do and pretending that you're better than them. Speaking of, we'll get access to 4th level spells at 7th level, so let's take a moment here to look over some of the more notable options. No matter what subclass you're playing, options like Aid, Spiritual Weapon, Spirit Guardians, Revivify, and Banishment are almost always worth consideration. Aid increases the max hit points of your party and can give you some extra room when healing so you can focus on other things, like, for example, Spiritual Weapon, which creates a spectral weapon as a bonus action that can attack for 1d8 plus your spellcast modifier without any concentration needed. On subsequent turns, you can move the weapon 20 feet and make another attack with it as a bonus action, but the spell can be even better if you upcast it as it deals an extra 1d8 per hit for each spell slot above second. And doing that much damage without concentration as a bonus action is not bad at all. And that lack of concentration can leave you ready for something like Spirit Guardians, one of the best spells in the game. Seriously, this spell will basically turn your cleric into a blender as they move around the battlefield with a 15 foot radius area centered on them where creatures of your choice must take 3d8 radiant damage against a wisdom save for half damage when they enter the area for the first time or start their turn within it. You have now weaponized your move and your bonus action, just dealing damage to everything around you while keeping your action free for something like Revivify in case an ally goes down. And if you're really up against something bad, you could always go for a spell like Banishment and just poof them away if they fail a Charisma save. Both Banishment and Spirit Guardians have wrecked my encounters on multiple occasions as a DM, and the few times I've had my enemies use them on my players, I've become instantly aware of just how potent these spells can be, as I've nearly TPK'd the party in most cases. So really in addition to what you get from your subclass up to this point, most of what you'll be using on the daily comes from your cleric spell list, and what a spell list it is. But if that's still not enough for you, just wait for what you get a little later. First, at level 8, we do have one more optional feature for Tasha's, wherein basically you're able to choose Blessed Strikes to deal 1d8 radiant damage along with your cantrips or weapon attacks once per turn, instead of the equivalent level 8 feature that your subclass gives you. Basically, it makes some options a bit more viable, like that trickster domain with the yucky poison damage that we don't want. But I suppose you've waited long enough now. Starting at level 10, you can ask your deity for divine intervention. In doing so, you would roll a d100 and any roll less than or equal to your cleric level means that your prayers are answered. Holy shit. <laughs> Ultimately, it's up to your DM as to how this occurs, and you can only attempt it once per long rest until you succeed, but it's essentially the wish spell at 10th level. Divine being, make so that I never hunger again. A fish? What the hell am I supposed to do with this? Notably, once God answers you, he goes on a seven day lunch break and all your prayers go straight to his voicemail. But this is extremely powerful, no doubt. I've had a cleric completely derail a campaign before by having his deity smite a seemingly indestructible evil item out of existence. And every level after 10th level sees you more and more likely to have your pleas heard and your request fulfilled until you reach 20th level. At 20th level, it just happens. <laughs> Straight up, you ask God for something and they just intervene on your behalf. What a freaking capstone. And the crazy thing is that this isn't even what makes the cleric so broken. It's everything leading up to it. In addition to everything we've covered so far, your cleric will get access to spells like Gios, Hero's Feast, Mass Cure Wounds, and True Resurrection. But even those high level spells might feel less useful than what you get so extremely early on. The low level spells and subclass features that make tier one play so trivial scale so extremely well in most cases, 
and turn the cleric from a broken healer and a broken supporter into one of the best and most broken damage dealers in the game. All at the same time. Let's be honest, there's no question here. <laughs> it's broken. But what wild experiences have you had playing a cleric in your games? And what ideas do you have for clerics in your adventures in the future? Let me know down in the comments, and don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more, and until next time, go out there and make some chaos.